Good afternoon. My name is Juan Jesus Garcia, and I am with the University of Alcala. I am academic leader of World Package 2 of UGLOB. It is a pleasure for me on behalf of World Package 2 to welcome you all to this first Spotlight on Education seminar in the frame of the UGLOB Alliance of Universities. Before introducing our speakers today, I would like to thank all the people that have made possible this event, namely Lorena Silos and Ana Gigosos from the University of Alcala and Sarah Westman from the University of Lund. I extend these thanks to the people who are in charge today of making everything work technically, in particular to Isabel Nilsson. Having said that, our speakers are Professor Rachel Forsyth from the University of Lund and Professor Javier Bueno from the University of Alcala. The seminar will be moderated by Professor Manuel Buenega, also from the University of Alcala. I would like to thank <coughs> for their commitment to participate in this first seminar. They all have experience and wide knowledge of the subject, so please feel to ask as many questions as you may have. So we hope you take advantage and enjoy this next hour of chat GPT. Uh, please, Professor Manuel Buenega, you have the floor. Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Manuel de Buenaga. And uh, yes, the webinar is centered about ChatGPT and its potential applications in education. And uh, in just a few months since its launch, uh, ChatGPT has made a significant impact in many fields such as education, marketing, economics, healthcare, and others. Uh, the same is true for a range of generative artificial intelligence tools that are taking on an increasingly prominent role. So as our speakers in the seminar, as Juan Jesus said, we have uh, Rachel Forsyth from Lund University and Javier Bueno. Uh, and in the first part of the webinar, uh, Rachel will provide us an introduction to ChatGPT in the context of uh, generative AI. And Javier will present us an example of application of ChatGPT in a university subject. Uh, after the two presentations, we will have a segment dedicated to questions, answers, and comments. So, uh, just uh, Rachel, uh, whenever you want. Okay, thank you. I'm going to share some slides. Now, I'm well aware that. Um, some of you will already know lots about generative AI, probably more than me. I'm coming at this from an education perspective. So I'm just gonna give a little bit of an overview for those people who may not know so much about it. Uh, and if you want to find out more, I'll put a link up towards the end. So yeah, my name's Rachel Forsyth. Thank you for the um, promotion, not a professor at Lund University, but I am an education developer. So I'm supporting teachers. Uh, and have special interest in assessment examination. So let's go straight in. I'm going to talk about some of the things that may concern us about generative AI tools, and then Javier is going to give us a really positive example of how we use them uh, and we can use them. So I don't want to be totally negative, uh, but there are some things we need to watch out for. So artificial intelligence in education is not new. Uh, I've put up a list here, a random list of some tools that you may already be familiar with. So artificial intelligence is a term we uh, we seem to be stuck with, uh, but it, these tools are not really intelligent. They have learned patterns of doing things. Uh, and I'm sure you will have used quite a lot of these either in your professional life or at home, um, right down to recommendations from Netflix or Amazon. Uh, to help you choose the next thing to spend your money on. Uh, and you may, in some institutions, also now have access as part of Microsoft's products to Bing search engine, uh, which uses uh, Bing chat, uses uh, chat GPT-4. So we're very used to these things, and we're also used to deciding what's acceptable for students to use and what isn't. So. You may allow students to use translation tools if they're writing in not in their first language, for example. We're all familiar with using spell checkers or grammar checkers, probably, in word processes. So every time one of these tools comes along, as teachers, we have decided what's acceptable and what isn't. And the same thing's going to happen here. 
uh, but you'll need to come to your own decision. So I'm just going to run through a few um, suggestions here. So the difference between artificial intelligence and this generative artificial intelligence, of which ChatGPT is one of the tools, um, here's a, I've, I've put the Wikipedia um, definition up. It's really good with just two sentences. I'll just let you read that. And there are a few words here that I want you to just focus on. So generative models uh, means that the software can produce new combinations uh, of outputs. So they could be uh, pictures and they could be words, text. Uh, and you'll have probably started to hear about videos as well. So deep fake videos that have been created using AI. Uh, and so that's what generative means. It just means it's creating something that appears to be new. But what you have to remember here, and it's really important from an educational perspective, is that these models are reproducing patterns and structures from their training data. They've been given examples of text, images, videos before, and they're producing things that look similar. And it's really important to remember that because that limits what they can produce. And it also means they're subject to any biases or limitations that were in the original training data. We've all been involved in training these, uh, these types of software, uh, either by creating material that's, apparent, that's available on the internet, so lots of us will have done that. Uh, but this trainer, so this um, image here on the left is something I took from Twitter in January. Uh, this guy saying that he was, he, he turned down a job training the software how to solve puzzles. Python is a programming language. So he would have just been sitting there um, working out all the steps that he took to fix a piece of code and typing that into the machine. That's how the training happened. It's not magic. It's real people generating content. Uh, and then I've put up these two captures. You'll have been familiar with these. These have gone a bit out of fashion now. Do you remember these ones where they were horrible fonts and you had to say the names that they're putting the letters and the numbers? Those were used to um, train systems to read um, historical handwriting. So they're super useful for digitizing old artifacts. Good use of AI. Uh, and on the right, we have here, um, <laughs> what are these that everyone hates? Uh, those are used for training self-driving cars. So every time you click on one of those, you are helping to train uh, an AI system. More positively, uh, there are some things that these tools can do. So they produce outputs. And what these outputs can do is they can summarize. You can put a PDF in, uh, and it can give you the main points. Uh, it can simplify things. So it can strip out extra language that makes it more complicated to read something. Uh, they can provide you with ideas for structuring a project or a piece of work. Uh, and so they can do lots of things uh, that we might find useful in academic life. And one thing that students say to us a lot is they're available when we're not available. Uh, so they're like a tutor that's available to them. However, <laughs> because of what I highlighted before, they can produce outputs that are wrong, uh, confusing, it's because they're just based on previous documents that exist. And I'm going to demonstrate some of these things, but mostly using images, not text, because it's just quicker to show you with images. But the same happens with text. So here's a very quite an early uh, from an early tool that was released earlier this year. This one was done in January. And the prompt was to create pictures that looked as though they were taken at a party in the 2000s. So, you know, when people didn't always have digital cameras to hand, uh, you can see by the framing, it's quite clever. It's framed them a bit strangely, uh, as if someone was just taking a snap with a handheld camera uh, and it came out on film. Uh, but if you look closely, there are some strange things. Apart from the shininess, that's a bit weird. Uh, this woman on the left has got a lot of teeth uh, and the woman on the right has a lot of fingers. So this is kind of an early version. These tools are getting better. Uh, but you do need to look out for these confusing things. Later on, this one's done in April. Uh, uh, this one had a lot of traction on social media. A lot of people really believed that people in Scandinavia send their small children 
to dress up like Vikings and uh, look a bit cross. Um, that doesn't exist. Just speaking there on behalf of anyone who lives in Scandinavia, uh, that's not a real thing, but it looks quite good. And here's another one. If you Google baby peacock right now, this is probably what you'll get as your top silly image. Uh, that's not what baby peacocks look like. That's what an AI system thinks a baby peacock looks like uh, based on what it has been trained on with an adult peacock and then small children having big eyes and big feet and looking cute. So we have to look out for these things. <laughs> They're plausible. It's a lovely picture, but it's not quite right. And this is, remember, the same with text. Now, these things are improving all the time. Um, earlier last week, I prompted uh, Bing AI to generate me some photographs of active a teacher using active learning techniques. Now, first glance, maybe it's okay. Maybe it's not active learning. That's absolutely for sure. But also, these are like adults sitting in children's desks, aren't they? The teacher's got his back to most of the students. Um, or in the second picture, possibly the teachers at the back. Uh, and the students have got their back to the teacher. Not really sure. Uh, there's still some weird things happening here. I do not know what is happening at the back here. Uh, that's a little bit worrying, isn't it? If you saw that in your classroom, uh, you'd probably want to make an intervention. At least I hope you would. Um, so then I prompted it again and said uh, two things. One is that active learning normally involves group work. And the second one is that students usually look happier when they're doing active learning. Uh, and so I've got this instead. Uh, again, <laughs> the teacher still seems to be very important here. Uh, they're all sitting at desks that are too big. They're not working together. And the other thing that will strike you now that I'm going to point out, if you haven't seen it, is that those students all look very similar. Uh, they're all dressed in the same sort of way, the same sort of hairstyles. They all seem to have the same ethnic background, no visible disabilities. Um, really not like a modern higher education classroom at all. So I'm doing this, as I said, just to show you that it's obvious when you look at images, there are things you need to look out for when you're using text um, with students too. So a lot of these things um, should worry us um, and they're mainly based on the fact that these training data may be quite restricted. Uh, it invents things, these hallucinations. So like the baby peacock, that doesn't exist. Uh, we don't know about the copyright of these things, uh, but the most important things to worry about are, <clears throat> are, are we expecting enough of our students if they use these systems? Uh, and who? how do we decide what the authorship is? So we don't have time today to uh, get into lots of detail about those, but I think we will come back to them, um, I'm sure, as part of Work Package 2 in the UGLO project. So I'm going to... Uh, we, we have agreed that we can use these tools um, in teaching at Lund University, <clears throat> as long as these pedagogic conditions are met, uh, and these are that the assessment is valid and reliable. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll put up a link to this data, uh, to this um, guidance and advice uh, when I've stopped presenting. So I'm gonna stop there, my time is up. Uh, if you do have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A or the chat, and I will pass over. Okay. Uh, after this interesting uh, talk given by, by Rachel, I'm going to to speak uh, from a uh, point of view of a teacher who are uh, interested in knowing whether the, the use of ChatGPT would be useful for the students or not. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organization for inviting me, inviting me sorry, to give this talk about the use of ChatGPT in computer science uh, subjects that Manuel Buenaga and I have carried out. We are both lecturers at the Department of Computer Science at the University of Alcalá, as Juan Jesus said. I have divided the talk into a brief, a brief introduction to the study we present the subject selected to carry out the tests and the queries made to ChatGPT as well as the, as the results and conclusions. Since November of last year, the use of ChatGPT has become widely popular in several areas of, of uh, our daily lives. ChatGPT is part of a set of generative language models that returns a textual answer to a given question. 
In the field of university teaching, the application of this type of models uh, is opening up a, a range of new possibilities. Uh, for this reason, in this talk, we present an initial evaluation of the use of the chat GPT 3.5 in a representative subject of computer science. The chosen subject is software engineering, which is taught in four degrees in the computer science branch uh, of the University of, of Alcala. Uh, so, uh, software engineering is a six ECTS subject and is taught in the second year, second term, it is from January to May. Here we can see a definition of what software engineering is. And the definition says so when engineering is the branch of computer science that deals with the design, development, testing, and maintenance of computer applications. The subject is divided into two, into two main parts, theory, that includes the theoretical part itself and exercises, and laboratory, in which guided practices and sort projects are carried out. Here you can see more or less the, the topics covered by the subject, like requirements, design, implementation, testing, maintenance, uh, management, software processes, software quality and metrics, and so on. The idea we have followed when carrying out the queries has been to put ourselves in the role of a student of the subject. In this way, we have made a set of theoretical questions that cover the contents of the different topics of the subject and that focus on the definition and explanation of concepts and on providing examples. Here I have translated some of the questions so that you can see the type of prompts made to activity. In this case, for example, uh, the first question is, what is a functional requirement in software engineering? How do you distinguish a functional requirement from a non-functional requirement? Can you give me a practical example of, his, uh, of it, uh, each state, etc.? In the case of the exercises, the type of questions varies between the topics that can be seen of the, on the slide, requirements classification, cyclomatic complexity calculations, test planning, refactoring. The questions shown on the slide are the summary statement of the exercise. Uh, as in many cases, the full statement provided uh, code snippets, list of requirements, etc. So we can see that for example, the first question is, please classify the, flow the following requirements as functional or non-functional. Please calculate the cyclomatic complexity of the following code fragment, etc. In the case of the laboratory, the following aspects were consulted. UML documents and diagrams, testing, metrics and software maintenance and tools. As in the previous slide, the actual statements included code fragments or descriptions of subsystems. So we can see, please tell me how many classes are used to implement the following program. Please obtain the code of a valid unit test for the following method in Java, etc. Well, in the following slides, I will show some of the behaviors observed in ChatGPT when giving a response. For example, if I ask ChatGPT, what is software engineering? The answer is correct. If we compare it with what we can find in books on the subject. So this is okay. In the case of examples, something similar happens. The results are mostly correct and well explained. In the case of exercises, 
it sometimes contradicts itself and corrects when corrects the error when confronted. Here is a fragment of the conversation in which ChatGPT gives a contradictory answer on the classification of a type of requirement and the subsequent correction. Uh, at this moment, ChatGPT is saying that the requisite is not functional, but before, a few minutes uh, before, it said that it was functional. And when it's confronted, he uh, apologizes and admits that it was wrong. In the case of uh, exercises or a different kind of exercises, as you can see on the slide, um, ChatGPT is able to reason correctly to give a good explanation of how to solve the problem, but uh, the result is often wrong and inconsistent with the explanation given. In this case, is uh, ChatGPT is given a code fragment and asked to calculate a complexity indicator. Well, the reasoning is correct, but the solution, the final solution, is not correct because the, the number, the magic number in this case is five. Okay, so this is not good. When confronted, it apologizes but makes new mistakes in this in this kind of exercises. And if uh, if we ask again ChatGPT to to solve the problem, uh, it tries new resolution strategies, which is very impressive, but mostly the, the final solution is still wrong. With reference to programming, it gets, uh, it gets an adequate set of classes. For example, in, in this case, in which we give them, gave them, a, gave, sorry, gave a GPT a description of a mechanical workshop, and he has to make a program a, uh, giving some classes in Java, and well, the solution wasn't bad, but the program didn't work. So uh, we think that its solution, although wrong, it can be used as a starting point for the student. Well, after analyzing the behavior observed in the different blocks of questions, we have assessed the accuracy of ChatGPT answers and the usefulness we believe it can offer to the student. Accuracy has to do with the quality of the, of the answers, whether they are correct or not. And usefulness is related in this case to the fact that interaction with ChatGPT can stimulate the learning's analytical skills as well as motivation for study. Looking at the graph, we can see that ChatGPT achieves greater accuracy in encyclopedic knowledge. For example, in this case, theory and examples and the part of the laboratory which is more theoretical, but not so much in practical questions such as solving exercises or practical tasks. Requirement classification, calculations, planning, refactoring, testing, metrics, etc. However, we think that although it is not completely reliable in its answers, it can be useful for a student who wants to look for information and to compare that information given for the for the artificial intelligence with the knowledge acquired in, in the classroom. So in this way, we believe that ChatGPT can be useful as a learning tool in the, in the subject under study. In this case, how in software engineering. And this is all I have to say in my presentation. Thank you, thank you for your interest. And uh, we are open to, to questions now in the, in the webinar, but if you want to contact us, Manuel or me, there you have our email addresses. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Javier. Uh, well, okay, so uh, we have uh, some questions or themes that uh, we'd like to address from the two different points of view. I mean, which uh, from the more general, generative AI point of view, and Javier, from your more specific experience of using ChatGPT in the computer science subject that you have just presented to us. I will introduce that now. I will introduce uh, some questions, and I also will include it one on the chat box uh, of Zoom uh, to help us to focus on it. Anyway, you can use it, and we will follow your questions, comments. Or so the first question would be this. <clears throat> so. In, in what ways can, GP, can chat GPT and other generative AI tools be useful for the teacher, for class preparation, for generating translation into other languages, what else? I mean, you have already provided us an interesting point of view of generative AI and also the specific experience of using chat GPT in that computer science subject, applying it to theory, exercises and the laboratory activities. But uh, could you please talk to us a little more about some other activities that you find relevant, especially for the teacher, as for generating course materials, generating assessment tags, or even evaluating a student performance, for instance. Uh, which of them can be really viable and which of them could be interesting? But maybe not possible with the present AI tools. Uh, Rachel, uh, what do you think about it from the more general generative AI point of view? Um, <laughs> I think we, we don't know yet uh, what, the, what the scope of these is gonna be, but I think the future will most certainly be in more, more targeted apps uh, that people use. So, uh, to take one example, uh, literature review is an area that a lot of um, app makers are looking at, at the moment. And the idea of that is it will search for relevant literature and provide you with a summary and the best, maybe a paragraph on each of the best ones that it finds. Um, right now, it's not that different to going to Google Scholar and looking for things and looking at the abstracts of the papers. That's it's not too far away from that right now. Uh, but I think that could improve. And where it will win over um, existing search engines like Google Scholar or databases um, is that you can probably prompt it a little bit more carefully. So I, I do work on um, accessibility and inclusion. I might want to look for papers on that topic that came from the Global South because that would give me a different perspective from what I normally get. The highest ranked things are always from English speaking countries. Uh, so I think this, these kind of niche applications will come up uh, and they'll be quite popular. Then we'll all be using these tools built into office tools like um, Microsoft Word or Google Docs. Uh, they're going to get better and better at suggesting uh, a tone of voice or the way that we write things. And that's particularly going to be useful if you're writing not in your first language, I think. So I think there's a lot of scope there for things to happen, but they will most likely it will come from us seeing new new products. That would be my guess. I don't know if Javier wants to add anything to that or say something completely different. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And, um, and I have to admit that for non-native speakers as me, English speakers as me, uh, I think that the use of some some tools like DeepL or even the translator from Google, well, it may be uh, wrong to say it, but but I think that uh, everybody uses these kind of tools. If we want to to look more native speaker, uh, I mean, perhaps uh, for us the problem is not the translation or to be understood, to be able of being understood for. The, for the other part of the conversation, but to the, the problem is the register. 
and to look more professional or, you know, more in this case, more academic. And I think that in this case, it, it can help us. Uh, of course, if you don't know anything about English or about Sumerian, I don't know, and you rely on this kind of tools, I think you are at a risk. I mean, you have to, to have a background, a certain background to use the, this kind of tools. And as a lecturer, for example, if I had to use ChatGPT moving to a different kind of, of artificial intelligence tool instead of translation, you know, if I had to, to use ChatGPT in my classes, perhaps I will use it to promote uh, discussion of ideas between my, my students. I mean, I think that the challenge for us, the, the lecturers, the teachers, is to, to elevate the learner, the learner to the position of being able to confront the artificial intelligence. I mean, if I, if I ask a question to, to ChatGPT, uh, I have to, to have this background to, you know, to know whether the, the question, the answer is correct or not or perhaps is giving me some clues about the solution of the problem I'm, I'm looking for. But uh, if I don't have uh, that kind of knowledge before the using of, uh, before using of ChatGPT, I think I, I'm going to, to make a lot of mistakes. As a learner, and as I say, our, our challenge, the, the challenge is to, to take the students and to give all the knowledge possible so he or she can use these kind of tools responsibly. Thank you. Uh, you say we have uh, uh, different questions, Rachel or? Okay. Well, so, another... yes, please. No, I was just gonna pick up uh, on what Javier said. So what, what, I, did, what I didn't say uh, earlier is that and, and some of these questions in the Q&A are, are picking this up. What, what's cheating? Uh, is it cheating to use these tools? Um, and these are decisions that people are going to have to make. What actually do you have to know? So Javier has just said he understands that uh, the tools make mistakes or that they give outputs that are wrong. Students have to learn to also make those judgments, and that's that, that won't go away. We still have to help them with that. They're not going to learn that just by putting prompts into a machine. They are going to have to learn what's a good answer and what's a bad answer. And that's, so So some of those questions that are in the Q&A, we can roll up by saying, we still need to teach. <laughs> it's not gonna, we're not gonna, we're not gonna be redundant yet. Mm, thank you. Okay, so I think we are going to, <clears throat> about this, we have also talked before about these questions. Um, I mean, uh, can GPT be useful in different, in different subject domains, such as mathematics, economics, or computer uh, science? In fact, some evaluations of uh, chat GPT applied in different domains uh, have suggested uh, different levels of accuracy. For instance, there are some studies indicating that GPT is quite good in economics, but it's, uh, it's not so good in the legal domain, for instance. Uh, even within a subject, for instance, Javier has presented us how the accuracy is different in several activities. So uh, what do you think? Uh, how can this uh, influence its use? Javier, for instance. Okay, in, in my case, uh, well, I, I don't know what to say of uh, different kind of um, domains uh, such as math mathematics, economics, and so on, because I think that uh, they should carry out a similar study that we have done. 
but I guess that, for example, in mathematics, this is not really good. Uh, the, the, in the accuracy of ChatGPT is not really good because uh, the, the few times that I test it, uh, the answer has the, the show the, the, the same problem that I related before when, when trying to calculate the complex index, uh, complexity index of, of a piece of code. I mean, perhaps the reasoning process is correct, but the answer is not. I don't know why, but the fact is, is that. So I don't know, perhaps in, in economics or medicine is different. Uh, I, I guess that here in this webinar, there are a lot of uh, professors and lecturers who belong to, to these kind of domains and perhaps they, they, they can say what they think the chat at the, at the end of the, at the end of the, um, this webinar. Rachel, what's your point of view? Yeah, just to add to that a little bit, I, I think yeah, computer scientists and informatics lecturers have been much quicker to build these tools into their use. To a certain extent, um, particularly in computing, like code generators have been around for a while anyway, just maybe not as cheap and accessible. So each, each subject area is going to have to come to this uh, and make their own choices, which is why I wanted to go back and do a little bit of the basic material. Everyone's got to be quite brave and just say, we need to make an evaluation of this. And, and a lot of the questions in the Q&A really bear this out. Uh, people are a little bit worried about it. I think we have to step forward with our students. Um, I, uh, uh, somebody, sorry, I'm just going to check the question again. But um, uh, I'm very sorry if I say this wrong. Villa um, Fune, you, you said that yeah, students are using it in a disruptive way sometimes. How can they use it to help themselves? And I'm sure some students are using it to help themselves to do exactly what Javier said, to look things up that are factual and theoretical and get good answers for them. Um, but we have to make a decision about what's acceptable. What do we consider cheating now? Um, and we certainly will have to think about how we frame examination questions when these tools are available. It's going to have to be different. Uh, because in the past, we might have thought that a student writing, let me say, a lab report on my background in physics, let's say writing a lab report on a fairly standard experiment, I don't know, um, acceleration due to gravity or something like that. Uh, so a standard experiment, we would expect the student to do the experiment, take the data, write a report, and they learn something from that. Now, if they could fabricate all the results and get the report written by another system, they've not learned anything. So we have to think about what is it that we want them to learn and how do they show it? And that's going to change probably uh, to some extent. And every discipline area is going to have to think about that differently. But I am pretty sure that every discipline area will be using some tools quite soon. Um, linking with uh, what uh, Rachel said, we, we haven't um, assessed the use of uh, ChatGPT in evaluation for the students. I mean, because I think that is our task as an expert on, on the subject and not to delegate to an artificial intelligence to do our work. And uh, we, we haven't tried that, that kind of questions. Um, we usually do the, the exams uh, in, in a written form, in paper, pen and paper, and so on. And for example, in, in laboratory, the practices and the sort projects, uh, they have uh, to give us a, a memory, a short memory, a sort of report of the, the practice, but they have to, to make a, a defense of, the, of his work. I mean, we have an interview and they are to ask our questions. And I think that this is the best, uh, the best way to know whether they are learning or not. They are copying, cheating, or what, you know? So in, in our case, in, in this subject, we, we don't use ChatGPT or any other artificial intelligence. We are more classical, perhaps, in this case of, of, um, of tasks. 
And I think that interviewing students, talking to them, asking them, seeing their reactions and so on, gave, gave us a lot of information and uh, an idea of how reliable are their, their work. Okay, another question uh, we have been talking before when preparing uh, the webinar uh, was this one. Wanted to write Q3. Um, could privacy and data security be a problem? Uh, in fact, when we are using this kind of tools, we introduce a lot of personal data and so and, and so on, and also some kind of sensible sensible information. Um, the case of uh, Italy, for instance, was a representative where GPT could not be used for several months because it did not comply with data protection laws. So. Uh, what uh, what do you think uh, about it, uh, uh, Javier, for instance? Well, in, in the case of using ChatGPT or some other artificial intelligence in in our subjects, uh, I'm not so sure sure about if uh, whether it it is privacy and data security could be a problem um, because. Everybody is giving uh, their data to the to the networks and to Google and to some other uh, companies for free without thinking of uh, on that. I mean, perhaps for for me, the copyright uh, copyright uh, issue would be more important for for students or for. Um, uh, our discipline. I mean, if I train a neural network with, with some information extracted from books, do I have to, to give a, uh, I mean, I don't know, royalties or something like that to the author of that books? I don't know. Uh, but in, in the case of privacy and data security, I, I don't see personally. I don't see it as a as an issue right now. Uh, although perhaps it is. I don't know. Perhaps Rachel has a, a different point of view. Um, I think it's a matter of personal choice. So students should always be allowed to not use these tools if they choose not to give their data away to the to, or to find out more. Um, I think. Microsoft particularly is being quite careful about this. So they, if you use um, uh, Bing Chat through an institutional account, it promises you that uh, it doesn't save the questions. That could be a problem for you, to be honest, because you might want to build on the questions. It doesn't save the questions. It strips out personal data before the query goes to their servers. Uh, so they pay quite a bit of attention to GDPR requirements Therefore, using these tools through an institutional account should always be safer. Uh, so I think, though, it will be a personal choice. And again, this will come down to uh, individual teachers and students needing to have that choice, but also subject areas. Uh, the copyright things, I think, are potentially problematic. And then you can imagine that in four or five years, the web will be full of text that's been generated by these tools. Uh, and it's just going to go around in circles and the quality will deteriorate massively. Right now it's trained on things that humans have produced. So I think we just have to be aware of those things. We, we're trying to give you an overview of the general issues here rather than get into the detail of what you should do or, or not do. Uh, but there, there are many things to think about uh, and we're going to have to step our way through this and take a little bit of time and some subject areas will go slower than other subject areas, and that's fine. We just have to do what you're comfortable with. This is not a train that's kind of going particularly, it looks like it's going fast because the software is improving, uh, but it's like all educational software. There are lots of people who want to sell you things. You don't have to buy them right now.
So <clears throat> we have already we have already talked about this, but uh, we wanted to focus a little bit on just on on this matter because it has been in fact uh, the main concern in several universities, colleges, and so on. So in fact, it has been uh, in several universities, it has uh, not been allowed the use of GPT and generative AI tools uh, directly. It seems, uh, for instance, that in Lund, as you commented before, Rachel, it has uh, uh, that has it has been decided a more constructive orientation. So, what do you think about this this question? Um, I think if you want to ban it, then you have to control all the uh, what the students do. So, you you can't ban it for normal studying uh, unless you're going to watch the students all the time. In examinations or assessments, whatever word you prefer there, uh, if you're going to ban it, you have to control the students. So you have to sit them all in a room and watch what they're doing, uh, probably um, use computers that can only do certain things because it's not detectable. Uh, we didn't mention that, uh, but it, th there's no reliable way of detecting it. And because of the way it works, by generating new combinations of words or pictures, it's very unlikely that we'll ever have a reliable detection tool. So again, I think in the short term, people will try and ban it and control examinations. But in the longer term, that doesn't that doesn't work for the kind of um, professional lives that we're preparing students for. We want them to often do work that they do over a long period of time um, and produce a large, you know, something substantial like a project report. So we can't control them all the time, and in re and in their future lives, they will be using these tools. So I think a ban is um, just a possibly a short term reaction until people understand these things better. It's not a long term solution. Sorry if that's what you were hoping for. Yeah, I agree with with Rachel in that this kind of technologies are are here and. I think they're going to stay for a long time. And it, at the beginning, the, in, in November of the last year, you know, uh, I, I didn't know about the existence of ChatGPT, to tell you the truth. And suddenly it was kind of not a tide, a high tide, but a tsunami, <laughs> because everywhere it was everywhere. It was everywhere. So, and I think that we have to to get used to to these kind of tools, and I have to to think how to use it uh, to facilitate the process learning of our students, even our process of learning uh, as a lecturers. And we have to to look for imaginative solutions, uh, which. Uh, promotes discussion, promotes comparison, promotes uh, contrasting several hypotheses, hypotheses, and, you know, contrasting several sources, this kind of thing. And of course, to be perhaps more relevant to what I have behind me, books <laughs> and authors and reliable people, you know. Uh, but having said that, I think that the use of ChatGPT in, in, in the case of students can help you can help them to um, improve the quality of writing, for example, not to cheat and to pretend that they are uh, that they have been doing that work and give it to you as a teacher, but so they can they can. Uh, they can see how to improve their the quality of writing, the the quality of their thoughts, the in some in some way to develop critical thinking. So I think this would this would be useful for them. How can we detect plagiarism or cheating or 
Well, I suppose that uh, something is difficult, but if you know your students and you read a text written by one of them, and the style, the words, the kind, the quality of the writing is far away from what you see every day in the classroom, I think you, you may suspect, but I don't know. <laughs> Perhaps it has, he has improved the, their knowledge. But this would be a, a clue. I think that it's important for us to, to know our students and to, to help them to use these kind of tools. Yes, me. I think we are a little tight on time because we wanted to, to dedicate just one hour. Yes, we have a, some interesting comments in the question and answer uh, window. So, don't know if we could, uh, we have not material now to, to, to revise or just to, to answer them. But um, what well, I think uh, we can, we can keep the, keep it as a record. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all. And we have also, you have also our emails. So if uh, you, you desire to contact with us, uh, it's welcome. So I think that we, uh, it's, different. it's difficult for us to, to, to revise them now. So uh, I, before just uh, saying goodbye, you know, I just wanted, uh, I think, uh, that we could uh, briefly uh, talk about this last question and and I think it would be enough. So I'm writing here. So <clears throat> uh, for closing, uh, what uh, could be the impact of these tools on our work in EU globe? So uh, this is the last question and also it could be the first one. So as we are doing it in the framework of these nine universities alliance, and of course it's possible that chat GPT and generative AI tools may play a lot of uh, different roles for the next months. But uh, what's your point of view at the moment? Oh, I'm just going to pick up because Gunter Freshel has put um, a comment in the quick Q&A about actually using AI with the International Health PhD and MSc programme and encouraging students to use these tools uh, and hopefully checking and talking to them about the validity. So someone's already doing this. So uh, that could be a subject for a future webinar, maybe um, a little bit of a case study, uh, not to put Gunter on the spot there, but I think that would be helpful. And he makes the really important point that um, sometimes the use of these tools uh, makes things more equitable because um, you can work in a non-native language. And the, and the person that said, do we need to learn languages? We still need to learn languages because we want to communicate with each other, not always through the medium of a computer. Um, so I think those of us who live and have lived in countries where we're not speaking our first language all the time, uh, you know, you, you, you can't manage just with Google Translate. It's useful, but it doesn't replace human interaction. Uh, and I think it, this will not replace human teachers either. So that's so I think in terms of UGLO, it's going to be useful for us maybe to speed up some things uh, and maybe let us give us more time to focus on human interactions. That's my positive ending. Well, in, in my case, I think that uh, these tools can impact in, in the aliens. Uh, in part, doing what we are doing right now, which is a, a kind of uh, you know, reflection community. We are thinking and we are discussing, we are giving our points of view about this technology, how to use it better or, or not to use it. I don't know, perhaps there are some people that think that this should be banned. But I think this is the one, one, one good point of this. Uh, this topic. And the other one uh, for me would be to, to replicate uh, 
the kind of study we did in, in our subjects and to see whether we can use ChatGPT or a different kind of artificial intelligence tools in our daily life, in our work with our students to ask them how to use, uh, how are they using ChatGPT or other artificial intelligence tool? Uh, what do they think? I don't know, uh, it has to promote the, the discussion between different stakeholders in this case. And I would like to, to know from everybody who is uh, writing in the Q and answers questions or some other participants who are interested in, in, in carry out a similar study or to give some ideas to others uh, about this topic. So I think it's quite positive, in fact. Thank you. So I think we are now. Uh, I think we are we are finally now. It's time to conclude the webinar. So Juan Jesus, I don't know if you want to say something. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Manolo, and thank again to our speaker and moderator for this interesting seminar, really a cutting edge topic. We hope you have enjoyed the seminar. I hope to see you on any of the coming webinars about Sin Money on November the 9th and the Source of Happiness on November the 19th. Um, we will have more, so you will receive the information about these coming webinars. Thanks a lot for your attendance and see you soon. Thank you.